So what, what about this notion, though, that, that some texts are just completely misquoted? In other words, oh, okay. Internal contradictions, fine. You resolve them the same way you resolve them in the Hebrew Bible. H apparent historical issues, errors, resolve them the same way, although you'll find far more issues to deal with in terms of apparent contradictions and historical questions uh, regarding the, the Hebrew Scriptures than you will regarding the New Testament, and you'll find a ton, 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 ton more regarding the Talmud as compared to New Covenant writings. But what about, okay, what about if they just misquote something so blatantly that they, they could not possibly have, have been reading the Bible intelligently? Again, I'll quote Rabbi Singer just as, as a representative voice. Moreover, in a distance, in, in an effort to distance Christians from a compelling Jewish message, the founders and defenders of Christianity methodically altered selected texts from the Jewish scriptures. This rewriting of Tanakh was not done arbitrarily or subtly. The church quite deliberately tampered with the words of the Jewish scriptures in order to bolster their most startling claim, which is the Old Testament foretold of no Messiah other than Jesus of Nazareth. With this goal in mind, missionaries manipulated, misquoted, mistranslated, even fabricated verses in Tanakh in order to make Jesus' life fit traditional Jewish messianic parameters and to make traditional Jewish messianic parameters fit the life of Jesus. Again, I told you there's this funny contradiction where we're told, well, Jesus did, you read the Gospels, he actually didn't fulfill any of the Messianic prophecies. And then we're told, well, they rewrote the Gospels to make them fulfill the prophecies, and then they changed the prophecies to make them fit the life of Jesus, but actually he didn't fulfill anything. It's, again, one of those funny self-contradictory positions. The King James Version and numerous other Christian Bible translations were meticulously altered in order to produce a message that would sustain and advance church theology and exegesis. This aggressive rewriting of biblical texts has had a remarkable impact on Christians throughout the world who unhesitatingly embrace these twisted translations. So let's take a look at, at Hebrews 10.5. Hebrews 10.5. Quoting from Psalm 40. We saw a couple of days back the, the messianic significance of the psalm. As the psalmist gets the great revelation, you, you, you don't want it's not the offerings you want. You want me. You want my life wholly dedicated, completely dedicated. But then, of course, his own sins overwhelm him. He falls short. It's Messiah who comes into the world that is the ultimate fulfillment of the text. And, is the very one to whom the sacrifice is pointed, life for life, an innocent victim for the guilty. Hebrews 10, 5, Therefore when Messiah came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. And I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, Here am I. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus, the Messiah, once and for all. So what's the big issue there? Well, those words, a body, you prepared for me. The Hebrew is osnayim karitali, which could mean ears, literally ears you have dug out for me. Some would translate it, you've, you've pierced my ears, meaning dedication to you. It would be a little bit unusual way to say it. It's possible. Could mean you dug out, bore out so that I could clearly hear. If, if you'll read five different Jewish commentaries, five different Jewish translations, you'll see that they're, they're approximating these words because it's, it's just a little difficult to know exactly what the Hebrew was saying. The overall sense is, is completely clear. I understand this and, and you want me. The Septuagint translated with a body you prepared me. How did they come to that? S some refer to it as metonymy or pars pro toto. These are phrases that are used, the part for the whole. In other words, they understood it was talking about having willing open ears, meaning surrender, sacrifice, willingness to, to, to give oneself, and hence they took the part for the whole. Surrendered ears, a whole body, a whole life. That was their deduction. Whether you think it's a good deduction or not, that was their deduction. And Hebrews did not erase what was written in the Hebrew text, 
writing in Greek to a Greek-speaking audience whose Bible, whose Jewish Bible would be the Septuagint. And if they're going to look up a verse, that's where they're going to look it up. He quoted from the Septuagint. That's all. And his, his big point, he doesn't major in that. He makes passing reference to the body of Jesus the Messiah. But his big point is, you put aside sacrifices and offerings with, here I am, I've come to do your will. He doesn't major on this. If, if, if the, there would have been no problem if the Septuagint said, my ears you've opened up. His point stands exactly the same. That with the coming of the one who says, here I am, I come to do your will. It's written to me in the scroll. That that now replaces the first. Instead of sacrifices and offerings, you have me. And this is ultimately the voice of the Messiah speaking through the psalm. Now here's what makes this more amazing. It's according to Rabbi Singer, some anti-missionaries, the Septuagint of, of everything outside of the Torah was actually translated by the church. So in other words, they said, all right, that's not in your Bible? Watch this. It doesn't, it doesn't say in your Bible that, that you have to go to Texas to be saved? Give me your Bible. Scratch it out and write it. There, see, it's written. I mean, that, that's actually what they're accused of doing. That because it wasn't written in the Bible, they now rewrote it, and now they said, see, there it is. Again, it's, it's mind-boggling that anyone could think that this happened. But not only so, all the evidence that we have indicates that these books were translated into Greek by various Jewish scholars before the writing of the New Covenant. And therefore, when they're quoting it, they're just quoting from a Jewish translation of their day. 